I'd like to thank both of you for coming in. My name is Liz Hillen. I'm a certified process and orthotist and clinical marketing consultant for SPS. And I have Nick and Rudy here from Beck. I'm Rudy Becker. Uh, I'm the vice president of marketing here at the company. I also oversee some of our, our patient care activities. And uh, I think this is my, my 21st year with the company outside of college. I, I also have a, a younger brother that works here along, along with our father as well. So it's still a, very much a family business here at, at Becker. I love it. And I'm Nick LaCurcy. I'm a certified orthotist. I've been with Becker about seven years. Prior to coming here, I was practicing at the University of Michigan and teaching orthotics at Eastern Michigan University. But at Becker, I lead Central Fab. I'm, the uh, Vice President of Services over Central Fab, and also I'm the Chief Technology Officer, and I developed and I led the development, actually, of Triple Act. What a great product. It's uh, been a game changer in the field. What led you, Nick, to developing this? What was the need that you saw in the field? Jim Campbell, who was the Executive Vice President at Becker at the time, we were at a show in Leipzig looking around, and Jim saw the need for a high stiffness ankle component as he elevated the, the need for that type of component, I began working on designs immediately uh, following the meeting. That's what precipitated the development of Triple Action. And over the course of the next few years, we added a couple more engineers to R&D and we uh, added some collaboration with some biomechanists outside of Becker. And we've had a great deal of time uh, working and collaborating to understand the effect of these components on gait and just come a very long way in, in developing the product and, and seeing it. some really nice applications and treating patients with it. So it's been, it's been very, very interesting, very good, and, and that we have something that applicable uh, to a lot of different products that we want to use it in for quite a while. Excellent. And Rudy, uh, explain the technology and how it works. And who would this technology really benefit the most? Sure. Well, and, you know, Nick as an orthos volume can talk a little better about that. But I can give you the overview. Uh, Nick and his team in R&D have put a lot into the development of this product. Now it's, it's turned into a suite of products, a family of products that we have. We have a video in the PDF of our data sheet here. This is the original joint that we developed, the, the A-size joint, the first one that we, we made. And it, we had some good success with it, but we have more. And as time went on, we, we added other models. Now there's a small adult model and we also have a pediatric model, a, an assessment device called the GEO that utilizes the small adult triple action that you can use to assess patient candidacy for an AFO, and not just a triple action AFO, but really any type of AFO, whether that be a solid ankle AFO, a AFO with a dorsiflexion assist Tamarack on it, or a triple action AFO. Triple action is so adjustable that trial it for those different types of scenarios to see what works best on the patient before committing to a, a definitive orthosis. And, and this one of these videos I'm showing you here on the left, we're showing, demonstrating how to adjust the alignment of the triple action. And I thought that'd be a good one to start with because the real beauty of the triple action is that everything is independently adjustable, whether that's the spring stiffness, the range of motion, or the ankle alignment degree, all be adjusted independently from one another. The, the functions are not influenced by each other as they are in something like a double action ankle joint. Whereas, you know, on a double action ankle joint, if I tighten down on the dorsiflexion resist channel with a set screw, it's going to change the whole alignment of the joint. That doesn't mm -hmm. happen with a triple action. I can change the range of motion of the dorsiflexion channel or the plantar flexion channel or the spring stiffness of either of those, and the alignment stays the same and it can be adjusted. In this video, they were just showing how quick and easy it is to adjust this product. You, you take your combination wrench, you rotate the upright to the degree you want it, and then you lock it back down and it's it's good to go. The same is true with other adjustments of it. If you were to adjust the plantar flexion ROM, I mean, all you have to do is undo a, loosen up a set screw side of the joint and then take your, your wrench and turn it. A very key thing about the triple action too to mention is that there's everything on this joint is measurable. And it's, it's all been, been designed so that you can have repeatable results with it. For instance, for every full turn of these boosters that we're doing here on the joint, you are adjusting the range of motion five degrees in terms of how you're adjusting this product to the patient. And you can document those, those things too in the patient notes and say, you know, we set it at, at five degrees of uh, 
plantar flexion or you know 10 degrees of dorsiflexion or whatever it is and then you know when the patient comes back for follow-up you, you know where you've left off and you know where you might want to go from there you can really measure what you're doing and and keep track of it one of the neat things that he's developed is this tuning procedure for these joints another part of your question you know who is this for it's for the wide array of different uh, pathology any really neural motor, motor deficit and in terms of casting protocol that you have to start off with that's number one and then number two in terms of how that joint is working are we seeing a damping effect in dorsiflexion plantar flexion Exactly how is the mechanism working for the patient? It's just like with any other AFO. We get a few degrees of dorsiflexion has range of motion with the knee extended or at R2 with the knee fully extended. The whole point is that what we want to do is we want to position the ankle within its passive range of motion with the alignment of the component. If you position the ankle toward the end of range of motion, let's say with a plantar flexion contracture, then the biomechanics of the limb, not the triple action, are the primary influencer of the gait pattern. And so what we want to do is have a certain amount of passive range of motion in dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the joint and the springs. One of the, Rudy mentioned one of the more important aspects of the joint, which is this independence of alignment, stiffness, and range of motion. One of the keys in addition to the tunability and independence of these adjustments is the high stiffness and the durability of the springs of the component. We've all used double actions. Uh, Becker's been making double actions for decades and they still are, have a great deal of clinical utility. Triple action, one of the goals that Becker had when we did was to make a, a component whose springs did not break or at least broke very rarely. How are the physical therapists responding to this great technology? We've had some. Uh, one of the great things about this, we do have reports from clinicians who have found an opportunity to increase and enhance their collaboration with physical therapy because you can, the adjustability of the component allows for the uh, collaboration between the physical therapist and the, and the orthotist to optimize to tune the gait pattern, to agree upon the goals for the patient, and then to use the component's adjustability to progressively help the patient achieve those goals. And as a therapeutic aid to help the therapist implementing their therapeutic treatment plan. So we think it's a really useful tool in, in the relationship between physical therapy and orthotics. And also, um, I have friends still at the University of Michigan uh, who have used this in the PT gym so that they can use it as an assessment tool with physical therapy, the geo that is, and bring it into the PT gym just to see relative benefit an orthosis might provide. And because of the adjustability, determine what type of orthosis or robotic design, it helps to expose the principal deficit that the mm -hmm. patient may be with so that the orthotic design becomes a little bit more obvious. Great. This goes really in line with the population and high intensity gait activities with repetition. This definitely is a product that would coincide really nicely with uh, the, the results. Of, in terms of the types of research that you've done, can you elaborate a little bit more what was studied? We did internal research during development at Becker, collaborating with the motion analysis lab, Lycon lab over at Eastern Michigan University. And we ran a number of different patients through the lab, subjects through the lab, to understand better the effect on gait biomechanics of the different aspects of the mechanics of the component. And so in those studies, we ran a number of different clinical presentations so that we could basically find the intersections between different types of biomechanical deficits and the, the general and most basic and fundamental influence of the component on gait. That we combined with collaborative study that we supported that was uh, led by Toshi Kobayashi. And the results of those studies uh, has been published peer review journal, including some work that was done by Pan Gao down at the University of Texas on the effect of shoes on the overall mm -hmm. status of these orthoses. It was pretty broad, far-reaching as far as the, the, the studies that we did. As with a lot of orthotics research, not a high number of patients. With the cohorts that were used for the studies, we learned a great deal 
enough to distill out the essence of what we thought would be an effective uh, kinematic tuning procedure, which is what we developed following those and based on those studies. Great. And in terms of fabrication, is this a device that can be fabricated in-house at a clinic? One thing that we learned during the course of our clinical trials was the importance of a certain threshold stiffness of the orthotic structure. What we learned was the structure of the orthosis was the weakest spring in the system and the effect of the component settings was not systematic on the gate pattern. We determined that there's a certain threshold, minimum stiffness for the structure of the orthosis in order to have systematic influence of the component on gate. And we even came up with a number. So based on that and through our mechanical studies, we, and through Central Fab, where we fabricate a lot of the black, we began building orthoses to that stiffness. And then we were able to come up with some very simple rules about the type of polypropylene and thickness that you sh would be recommended and really strip down and, and create a real low profile of the orthosis as long as you use a uh, composite structure that has appropriate torsional stiff. We just give uh, simple instructions in our fabrication instructions about the type and thickness of materials that's recommended. We find that clinicians, uh, really technicians, have told us that they really like working with the components. It's not too difficult. That's great. I mean, it, in terms of setting this up for a patient, does a clinician need to use a test orthosis for the fitting, or is it that versatile that it doesn't require that? Yeah, it doesn't require that. We recommend it for the dual booster. We have says you'll have everything that you need. The systematic tuning procedure gives guidance on how to select springs and how to adjust the component. If you start off on the first patient or two with double booster, you'll gain a quick familiarity with how the component fits. That's excellent. How does a clinician choose which is the right size based on weight? How does a clinician decide on which is the most appropriate? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing in choosing determine the weight of the patient, and that'll determine whether you need one joint and a unilateral. That's the first step. The second step excellent. is to pick the booster configuration of the excellent. size joint. That's what this chart is all about. It might seem a little busy at first, but basically you are selecting the booster configuration of the joint by determining where the gait abnormality is occurring, whether that's an early stance phase or late stance phase. After that, you're picking the leg and the side and arriving at whatever part number that you need to get the size, joint, and booster configuration that you're looking for. Step three is to consider how you're gonna fabricate this, this product. Mm -hmm. And that's also based on um, material selection. This is what we suggest. You can see in, in for thermoplastics, for instance, we suggest that you combine it with a camber axis triple action companion joint if you're using it just a unilateral triple action joint. Mm -hmm. The last step is selecting the type of stirrup you want and that's based on the size. Very nice. And in terms of going above the knee, maybe in the acute phases uh, for patients who maybe your spinal cord population who need a thigh, you know, thigh stability or femur femoral control, you know, tibial control. Is this recommended with uh, KFO design as well? Yes, we've had good experiences with using triple action on KFOs. Um, even I did a case study a, a couple of years ago at that using triple action with a locked knee and polio leg patients. Uh, but mm -hmm. we've also used triple action uh, with similar presentations in combination with the, the Bosco SPL stance mm -hmm. based found it really worked nicely. It's not as common, of course, because everybody's mm -hmm. trying to do it as much as they can without crossing the knee, but we have had a number of work that way as well. Yes, that combination with uh, hip activated stance control, knee joint, the SPL too, with the, uh, the triple action makes great sense for a you know, certain type of population, absolutely. Well, very good. Well, this we appreciate your collaboration. We appreciate your partnership. Thank you so much for educating our field. You know, we look forward to more adventures with you. Thank you for coming to our live event and explaining this great technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Thanks again for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. Great job.